Part Three, Chapter Six of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part Three, Chapter Six. I don't believe it. I can't believe it," repeated Razumian, trying in perplexity to refute Raskolnikov's arguments. They were by now approaching Bakaliev's lodgings, where Pulcheria Alexandrovna and Donia had been expecting them a long while. Razumian kept stopping on the way in the heat of discussion, confused and excited by the very fact that they were for the first time speaking openly about it. "'Don't believe it, then!' answered Raskolnikov with a cold, careless smile. You were noticing nothing as usual, but I was weighing every word. You are suspicious. That is why you weighed their words. Hmm. Certainly, I agree. Porfiry's tone was rather strange, and still more that wretch Zamatov. You are right. There was something about him. But why? Why? He has changed his mind since last night. Quite the contrary. If they had that brainless idea, they would do their utmost to hide it, and conceal their cards, so as to catch you afterwards. But it was all impudent and careless. If they had had facts, I mean real facts, or at least grounds for suspicion, then they would certainly have tried to hide their game, in the hope of getting more. They would have made a search long ago, besides. But they have no facts, not one. It is all mirage, all ambiguous, simply a floating idea. So they tried to throw me out by impudence. And perhaps he was irritated at having no facts, and blurted it out in his vexation. Or perhaps he has some plan. He seems an intelligent man. Perhaps he wanted to frighten me by pretending to know. They have a psychology of their own, brother. But it is loathsome explaining it all. Stop and it's insulting, insulting! I understand you. But, since we have spoken openly now, and it is an excellent thing that we have at last, I am glad. I will own now, frankly, that I noticed it in them long ago, this idea. Of course the merest hint only, an insinuation. But why an insinuation, even? How dare they? What foundation have they? If only you knew how furious I have been! Think only. Simply because a poor student, unhinged by poverty and hypochondria, on the eve of a serious delirious illness, note that, suspicious, vain, proud, who has not seen a soul to speak to for six months, in rags and in boots without soles, has to face some wretched policeman and put up with their insolence, and the unexpected debt thrust under his nose, the I.O.U. presented by Chebarov, the new paint, thirty degrees reamure, and a stifling atmosphere, a crowd of people that talk about the murder of a person where he had been just before, and all that on an empty stomach. He might well have a fainting fit. And that, that is what they found it all on. Damn them! I understand how annoying it is, but in your place, Rodya, I would laugh at them, or, better still, spit in their ugly faces, and spit a dozen times in all directions. I'd hit out in all directions, neatly too, and so I'd put an end to it. Damn them! Don't be downhearted. It's a shame." He really has put it well, though, Raskolnikov thought. Damn them? But the cross-examination again, tomorrow, he said with bitterness. Must I really enter into explanations with them? I feel vexed as it is, that I condescended to speak to Zamatov yesterday in the restaurant. Damn it! I will go myself to Porfiry. I will squeeze it out of him, as one of the family. He must let me know the ins and outs of it all. And as for Zamatov, At last he sees through him, thought Raskolnikov. Stay! cried Razumian, seizing him by the shoulder again. Stay! You are wrong. I have thought it out. You are wrong. How was that a trap? You say that the question about the workman was a trap. But if you had done that, could you have said you had seen them painting the flat, and the workman? On the contrary, you would have seen nothing, even if you had seen it. Who would own it against himself? 
If I had done that thing, I should certainly have said that I had seen the workman and the flat," Raskolnikov answered, with reluctance and obvious disgust. But why speak against yourself? Because only peasants or the most inexperienced novices deny everything flatly at examinations. If a man is ever so little developed and experienced, he will certainly try to admit all the external facts that can't be avoided, but will seek other explanations of them, will introduce some special, unexpected turn, that will give them another significance and put them in another light. Porfiry might well reckon that I should be sure to answer so, and say I had seen them to give an air of truth, and then make some explanation. But he would have told you at once that the workman could not have been there two days before, and that therefore you must have been there on the day of the murder at eight o'clock, and so he would have caught you over a detail. Yes, that is what he was reckoning on, that I should not have time to reflect, and should be in a hurry to make the most likely answer, and so would forget that the workman could not have been there two days before. But how could you forget it? Nothing easier. It is in just such stupid things clever people are most easily caught. The more cunning a man is, the less he suspects he will be caught in a simple thing. The more cunning a man is, the simpler the trap he must be caught in. Porfiry is not such a fool as you think." "'He is a knave, then, if that is so.' Raskolnikov could not help laughing. But at the very moment he was struck by the strangeness of his own frankness, and the eagerness with which he had made this explanation, though he had kept up all the preceding conversation with gloomy repulsion, obviously with a motive from necessity. I am getting a relish for certain aspects," he thought to himself, but almost at the same instant he became suddenly uneasy, as though an unexpected and alarming idea had occurred to him. His uneasiness kept on increasing. They had just reached the entrance to Bakaliev's. "'Go in alone,' said Raskolnikov suddenly. "'I will be back directly.' "'Where are you going? Why, we are just here. I can't help it. I will come in half an hour. Tell them. Say what you like, I will come with you." "'You too want to torture me!' he screamed with such bitter irritation, such despair in his eyes that Razumihin's hands dropped. He stood for some time on the steps, looking gloomily at Raskolnikov striding rapidly away in the direction of his lodging. At last, gritting his teeth and clenching his fist, he swore he would squeeze Porfiry like a lemon that very day and went up the stairs to reassure Pulcheria Alexandrovna, who was by now alarmed at their long absence. When Raskolnikov got home, his hair was soaked with sweat, and he was breathing heavily. He went rapidly up the stairs, walked into his unlocked room, and at once fastened the latch. Then, in senseless terror, he rushed to the corner, to that hole under the paper where he had put the things. He put his hand in and for some minutes felt carefully in the hole, in every crack and fold of the paper. Finding nothing, he got up and drew a deep breath. As he was reaching the steps of Bakaliev's, he suddenly fancied that something, a chain, a stud, or even a bit of paper in which they had been wrapped with the old woman's handwriting on it, might somehow have slipped out and been lost in some crack, and then might suddenly turn up as unexpected, conclusive evidence against him. He stood as though lost in thought, and a strange, humiliated, half-senseless smile strayed on his lips. He took his cap at last and went quietly out of the room. His ideas were all tangled. He went dreamily through the gateway. "'Here he is himself!' shouted a loud voice. He raised his head. The porter was standing at the door of his little room and was pointing him out to a short man who looked like an artisan wearing a long coat and a waistcoat, and looking at a distance remarkably like a woman. He stooped, and his head in a greasy cap hung forward. From his wrinkled, flabby face he looked over fifty. His little eyes were lost in fat, and they looked out grimly, sternly, and disconnectedly. "'What is it?' Raskolnikov asked, going up to the porter. The man stole a look at him from under his brows, and he looked at him attentively, deliberately. Then he turned slowly and went out of the gate into the street without saying a word. "'What is it?' cried Raskolnikov. "'Why, he there was asking whether a student lived here, 
mentioned your name and whom you lodged with. I saw you coming and pointed you out and he went away. It's funny." The porter too seemed rather puzzled, but not much so, and after wondering for a moment he turned and went back to his room. Raskolnikov ran after the stranger, and at once caught sight of him walking along the other side of the street with the same even deliberate step, with his eyes fixed on the ground, as though in meditation. He soon overtook him, but for some time walked behind him. At last, moving on to a level with him, he looked at his face. The man noticed him at once, looked at him quickly, but dropped his eyes again, and so they walked for a minute side by side without uttering a word. "'You were inquiring for me, of the porter?' Raskolnikov said at last, but in a curiously quiet voice. The man made no answer, he didn't even look at him. Again they were both silent. "'Why do you? Come and ask for me, and say nothing. What's the meaning of it?' Raskolnikov's voice broke, and he seemed unable to articulate the words clearly. The man raised his eyes this time and turned a gloomy, sinister look at Raskolnikov. "'Murderer!' he said suddenly, in a quiet but clear and distinct voice. Raskolnikov went on walking beside him. His legs felt suddenly weak, a cold shiver ran down his spine, and his heart seemed to stand still for a moment then suddenly began throbbing as though it were set free. So they walked for about a hundred paces, side by side, in silence. The man did not look at him. "'What do you mean? What is... who is a murderer?' muttered Raskolnikov hardly audibly. "'You are a murderer,' the man answered still more articulately and emphatically, with a smile of triumphant hatred and again he looked straight into Raskolnikov's pale face and stricken eyes. They had just reached the crossroads. The man turned to the left without looking behind him. Raskolnikov remained standing, gazing after him. He saw him turn round fifty paces away and look back at him, still standing there. Raskolnikov could not see clearly, but he fancied that he was again smiling the same smile of cold hatred and triumph. With slow, faltering steps, with shaking knees, Raskolnikov made his way back to his little garret, feeling chilled all over. He took off his cap and put it on the table, and for ten minutes he stood without moving. Then he sank exhausted on the sofa, and with a weak moan of pain he stretched himself on it. So he lay for half an hour. He thought of nothing. Some thoughts or fragments of thoughts some images without order or coherence floated before his mind, faces of people he had seen in his childhood, or met somewhere once, whom he would never have recalled, the belfry of the church at V, the billiard-table in a restaurant, and some officers playing billiards, the smell of cigars in some underground tobacco-shop, a tavern-room, a back staircase quite dark, all sloppy with dirty water and strewn with eggshells and the Sunday bells floating in from somewhere. The images followed one another, whirling like a hurricane. Some of them he liked and tried to clutch at, but they faded and all the while there was an oppression within him, but it was not overwhelming, sometimes it was even pleasant. The slight shivering still persisted, but that too was an almost pleasant sensation. He heard the hurried footsteps of Razumian. He closed his eyes and pretended to be asleep. Razumian opened the door and stood for some time in the doorway, as though hesitating. Then he stepped softly into the room and went cautiously to the sofa. Raskolnikov heard Nastasia's whisper, "'Don't disturb him. Let him sleep. He can have his dinner later.' "'Quite so,' answered Razumian. Both withdrew carefully and closed the door. Another half-hour passed. Raskolnikov opened his eyes, turned on his back again, clasping his hands behind his head. Who is he? Who is that man who sprang out of the earth? Where was he? What did he see? He has seen it all, that's clear. But where was he then? And from where did he see? Why has he only now sprung out of the earth? And how could he see? Is it possible?" Hm, continued Raskolnikov, turning cold and shivering and the jewel-case Nikolai found behind the door. Was that possible? A clue? 
You miss an infinitesimal line and you can build it into a pyramid of evidence. A fly flew by and saw it. Is it possible? He felt with sudden loathing how weak, how physically weak he had become. I ought to have known it, he thought with a bitter smile. And how dared I, knowing myself, knowing how I should be, take up an axe and shed blood? I ought to have known beforehand. Ah, but I did know," he whispered in despair. At times he came to a standstill at some thought. No, those men are not made so. The real master, to whom all is permitted, storms Toulon, makes a massacre in Paris, forgets an army in Egypt, wastes half a million men in the Moscow expedition and gets off with a jest at Vilna. And altars are set up to him after his death, and so all is permitted. No. Such people, it seems, are not of flesh, but of bronze." One sudden irrelevant idea almost made him laugh. Napoleon, the Pyramids, Waterloo, and a wretched skinny old woman, a pawnbroker with a red trunk under her bed. It's a nice hash for Porfiry Petrovitch to digest. How can they digest it? It's too inartistic! A Napoleon creep under an old woman's bed! Ugh! How loathsome!" At moments he felt he was raving. He sank into a state of feverish excitement. "'The old woman is of no consequence,' he thought hotly and incoherently. "'The old woman was a mistake, perhaps. But she is not what matters. The old woman was only an illness. I was in a hurry to overstep. I didn't kill a human being, but a principal. I killed the principal, but I didn't overstep. I stopped on this side. I was only capable of killing. And it seems I wasn't even capable of that. Principal? Why was that fool Razumian abusing the socialists? They are industrious, commercial people. The happiness of all is their case. No, life is only given to me once, and I shall never have it again. I don't want to wait for the happiness of all. I want to live myself, or else better not live at all. I simply couldn't pass by my mother starving, keeping my rouble in my pocket while I waited for the happiness of all. I am putting my little brick into the happiness of all, and so my heart is at peace. Ha ha! Why have you let me slip? I only live once. I too want— Eh! I am an aesthetic louse and nothing more!" he added suddenly, laughing like a madman. Yes. I am certainly a louse," he went on, clutching at the idea, gloating over it and playing with it with a vindictive pleasure. In the first place, because I can reason that I am one, and secondly, because for a month past I have been troubling benevolent providence, calling it to witness that not for my own fleshly lust did I undertake it, but with a grand and noble object, ha <laughs> ha! Thirdly, because I aimed at carrying it out as justly as possible weighing, measuring, and calculating. Of all the lice I picked out the most useless one and proposed to take from her only as much as I needed for the first step, no more, no less, so the rest would have gone to a monastery according to her will. <laughs> and what shows that I am utterly a louse," he added, grinding his teeth, is that I am perhaps viler and more loathsome than the louse I killed and I felt beforehand that I should tell myself so after killing her. Can anything be compared with the horror of that? The vulgarity, the abjectness! I understand the prophet with his sabre on his steed. Allah commands and trembling creation must obey. The prophet is right. He is right when he sets a battery across the street and blows up the innocent and the guilty without deigning to explain. It's for you to obey, trembling creation, and not to have desires, for that's not for you. I shall never, never forgive the old woman." His hair was soaked with sweat, his quivering lips were parched, his eyes were fixed on the ceiling. Mother, sister, how I love them! Why do I hate them now? Yes, I hate them. I feel a physical hatred for them. I can't bear them near me. I went up to my mother and kissed her, I remember, to embrace her and think if she only knew. Shall I tell her then? 
that's just what I might do. She must be the same as I am," he added, straining himself to think, as it were struggling with delirium. Ah, how I hate the old woman now! I feel I should kill her again if she came to life. Poor Lizaveta! Why did she come in? It's strange, though, why is it I scarcely ever think of her, as though I hadn't killed her? Lizaveta, Sonia, poor gentle things with gentle eyes! Dear women! Why don't they weep? Why don't they moan? They give up everything! Their eyes are soft and gentle. Sonia, Sonia, gentle Sonia!" He lost consciousness. It seemed strange to him that he didn't remember how he got into the street. It was late evening. The twilight had fallen and the full moon was shining more and more brightly. But there was a peculiar breathlessness in the air. There were crowds of people in the street. Workmen and business people were making their way home. Other people had come out for a walk. There was a smell of mortar, dust and stagnant water. Raskolnikov walked along, mournful and anxious. He was distinctly aware of having come out with a purpose, of having to do something in a hurry, but what it was he had forgotten. Suddenly he stood still and saw a man standing on the other side of the street beckoning to him. He crossed over to him, but at once the man turned and walked away with his head hanging, as though he had made no sign to him. Stay! Did he really beckon? Raskolnikov wondered, but he tried to overtake him. When he was within ten paces, he recognized him and was frightened. It was the same man with stooping shoulders in the long coat. Raskolnikov followed him at a distance. His heart was beating. They went down a turning. The man still did not look round. Does he know I am following him? thought Raskolnikov. The man went into the gateway of a big house. Raskolnikov hastened to the gate and looked in to see whether he would look round and sign to him. In the courtyard the man did turn round and again seemed to beckon him. Raskolnikov at once followed him into the yard, but the man was gone. He must have gone up the first staircase. Raskolnikov rushed after him. He heard slow, measured steps two flights above. The staircase seemed strangely familiar. He reached the window on the first floor. The moon shone through the panes with a melancholy and mysterious light. Then he reached the second floor. Bah! This is the flat where the painters were at work. But how was it he did not recognize it at once? The steps of the man above had died away. So he must have stopped or hidden somewhere. He reached the third story. Should he go on? There was a stillness that was dreadful. But he went on. The sound of his own footsteps scared and frightened him. How dark it was! The man must be hiding in some corner here. Ah! The flat was standing wide open. He hesitated and went in. It was very dark and empty in the passage, as though everything had been removed. He crept on tiptoe into the parlour which was flooded with moonlight. Everything there was as before, the chairs, the looking-glass, the yellow sofa and the pictures in the frames. A huge, round, copper-red moon looked in at the windows. "'It's the moon that makes it so still weaving some mystery," thought Raskolnikov. He stood and waited, waited a long while, and the more silent the moonlight, the more violently his heart beat, till it was painful. And still the same hush. Suddenly he heard a momentary sharp crack like the snapping of a splinter and all was still again. A fly flew up suddenly and struck the window-pane with a plaintive buzz. At that moment he noticed in the corner between the window and the little cupboard something like a cloak hanging on the wall. Why is that cloak here? he thought. It wasn't there before. He went up to it quietly and felt that there was someone hiding behind it. He cautiously moved the cloak and saw, sitting on a chair in the corner, the old woman bent double so that he couldn't see her face. But it was she. He stood over her. She is afraid he thought. He stealthily took the axe from the noose and struck her one blow, then another on the skull. But strange to say, she did not stir, as though she were made of wood. He was frightened, bent down nearer and tried to look at her, but she too bent her head lower. 
He bent right down to the ground and peeped up into her face from below. He peeped and turned cold with horror. The old woman was sitting and laughing, shaking with noiseless laughter, doing her utmost that he should not hear it. Suddenly he fancied that the door from the bedroom was opened a little, and that there was laughter and whispering within. He was overcome with frenzy, and he began hitting the old woman on the head with all his force. But at every blow of the axe the laughter and whispering from the bedroom grew louder, and the old woman was simply shaking with mirth. He was rushing away, but the passage was full of people. The doors of the flat stood open, and on the landing, on the stairs, and everywhere below there were people, rows of heads, all looking, but huddled together in silence and expectation. Something gripped his heart, his legs were rooted to the spot, they would not move. He tried to scream, and woke up. He drew a deep breath, but his dream seemed strangely to persist. His door was flung open, and a man whom he had never seen stood in the doorway watching him intently. Raskolnikov had hardly opened his eyes, and he instantly closed them again. He lay on his back without stirring. "'Is it still a dream?' he wondered, and again raised his eyelids hardly perceptibly. The stranger was standing in the same place, still watching him. He stepped cautiously into the room, carefully closing the door after him. He went up to the table, paused a moment, still keeping his eyes on Raskolnikov, and noiselessly seated himself on the chair by the sofa. He put his hat on the floor beside him, and leaned his hands on his cane and his chin on his hands. It was evident that he was prepared to wait indefinitely. As far as Raskolnikov could make out from his stolen glances, he was a man no longer young, stout, with a full, fair, almost whitish beard. Ten minutes passed. It was still light, but beginning to get dusk. There was complete stillness in the room. Not a sound came from the stairs. Only a big fly buzzed and fluttered against the window-pane. It was unbearable at last. Raskolnikov suddenly got up and sat on the sofa. Come, tell me what you want." "'I knew you were not asleep, but only pretending,' the stranger answered oddly, laughing calmly. "'Arkady Ivanovich Sredrigailov, allow me to introduce myself.'" End of Part 3, Chapter 6《Part Four, Chapter One of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Part Four, Chapter One. Can this be still a dream? Raskolnikov thought once more. He looked carefully and suspiciously at the unexpected visitor. Svidra Gailov, what nonsense! It can't be," he said at last aloud in bewilderment. His visitor did not seem at all surprised at this exclamation. "'I've come to you for two reasons. In the first place, I wanted to make your personal acquaintance, as I have already heard a great deal about you that is interesting and flattering. Secondly, I cherish the hope that you may not refuse to assist me in a matter directly concerning the welfare of your sister, Avdotya Romanovna for without your support she might not let me come near her now, for she is prejudiced against me, but with your assistance I reckon on—' "'You reckon wrongly,' interrupted Raskolnikov. "'They only arrived yesterday, may I ask you?' Raskolnikov made no reply. "'It was yesterday, I know. I only arrived myself the day before. "'Well, let me tell you this, Rodion Romanovitch. I don't consider it necessary to justify myself, but kindly tell me what was there particularly criminal on my part in all this business, speaking without prejudice, with common sense." Raskolnikov continued to look at him in silence. "'That, in my own house, I persecuted a defenceless girl and insulted her with my infamous proposals. Is that it? I am anticipating you.' But you've only to assume that I, too, am a man et nil humanum, in a word, that I am capable of being attracted and falling in love, which does not depend on our will. Then everything can be explained in the most natural manner. The question is, 
am I a monster, or am I myself a victim? And what if I am a victim? In proposing to the object of my passion to elope with me to America or Switzerland, I may have cherished the deepest respect for her and may have thought that I was promoting our mutual happiness. Reason is the slave of passion, you know. Why, probably, I was doing more harm to myself than anyone. But that's not the point," Raskolnikov interrupted with disgust. It's simply that, whether you are right or wrong, we dislike you. We don't want to have anything to do with you. We show you the door. Get out!" Svidrigailov broke into a sudden laugh. "'But you're—' "'There's no getting round you,' he said, laughing in the frankest way. "'I hope to get round you, but you took up the right line at once. But you are trying to get round me still.' "'What of it? What of it?' cried Svidrigailov, laughing openly. But this is what the French call bonne guerre, and the most innocent form of deception. But still you have interrupted me. One way or another, I repeat again. There would never have been any unpleasantness except for what happened in the garden. Marfa Petrovna—' "'You have got rid of Marfa Petrovna, too, so they say,' Raskolnikov interrupted rudely. "'Oh, you've heard that, too, then. You be sure to, though.' But as for your question, I really don't know what to say, though my own conscience is quite at rest on that score. Don't suppose that I am in any apprehension about it. All was regular and in order. The medical inquiry diagnosed apoplexy due to bathing immediately after a heavy dinner and a bottle of wine, and indeed it could have proved nothing else. But I'll tell you what I have been thinking to myself of late, on my way here in the train. Especially, didn't I contribute to all that calamity, morally in a way, by irritation or something of the sort? But I came to the conclusion that that too was quite out of the question. Raskolnikov laughed. I wonder you trouble yourself about it. But what are you laughing at? Only consider, I struck her just twice with a switch. There were no marks even. Don't regard me as a cynic, please. I am perfectly aware how atrocious it was of me and all that. But I know for certain, too, that Marfa Petrovna was very pleased at my, so to say, warmth. The story of your sister had been wrung out to the last drop. For the last three days Marfa Petrovna had been forced to sit at home. She had nothing to show herself within the town. Besides, she had bored them so with that letter. You heard about her reading the letter. And all of a sudden those two switches fell from heaven. Her first act was to order the carriage to be got out. Not to speak of the fact that there are cases when women are very, very glad to be insulted in spite of all their show of indignation. There are instances of it with everyone. Human beings in general, indeed, greatly love to be insulted, have you noticed that? But it's particularly so with women. One might even say it's their only amusement. At one time Raskolnikov thought of getting up and walking out and so finishing the interview, but some curiosity and even a sort of prudence made him linger for a moment. "'You are fond of fighting?' he asked carelessly. "'No, not very,' Svidrigailov answered calmly. "'And Marfa Petrovna and I scarcely ever fought. We lived very harmoniously, and she was always pleased with me. I only used the whip twice in all our seven years not counting a third occasion of a very ambiguous character. The first time, two months after our marriage, immediately after we arrived in the country, and the last time was that of which we are speaking. Did you suppose I was such a monster, such a reactionary, such a slave-driver? Ha, ha! By the way, do you remember, Rodion Romanovich, how a few years ago, in those days of beneficent publicity, a nobleman, I've forgotten his name, was put to shame everywhere, in all the papers, for having thrashed a German woman in the railway train. You remember? It was in those days, that very year, I believe, the disgraceful action of the age took place. You know, the Egyptian nights, that public reading, you remember? The dark eyes, you know. Ah, the golden days of our youth, where are they? Well, as for the gentleman who thrashed the German, I feel no sympathy with him because, after all, what need is there for sympathy? But I must say that there are sometimes such provoking Germans 
that I don't believe there is a progressive who could quite answer for himself. No one looked at the subject from that point of view then, but that's the truly humane point of view, I assure you." After saying this, Svidrigailov broke into a sudden laugh again. Raskolnikov saw clearly that this was a man with a firm purpose in his mind and able to keep to himself. "'I expect you've not talked to anyone for some days,' he asked. "'Scarcely anyone. I suppose you are wondering at my being such an adaptable man. No, I am only wondering at your being too adaptable a man. Because I am not offended at the rudeness of your questions? Is that it? But why take offence? As you asked, so I answered he replied with a surprising expression of simplicity. "'You know, there's hardly anything I take interest in,' he went on, as it were dreamily. "'Especially now. I've nothing to do.' "'You are quite at liberty to imagine, though, that I am making up to you with a motive, particularly as I told you I want to see your sister about something. But I'll confess frankly, I am very much bored. The last three days especially, so I am delighted to see you.' Don't be angry, Rodion Romanovitch, but you seem to be somehow awfully strange yourself. Say what you like, there's something wrong with you. And now, too. Not this very minute, I mean, but now generally. Well, well, I won't, I won't, don't scowl. I am not such a bear, you know, as you think." Raskolnikov looked gloomily at him. You are not a bear, perhaps, at all, he said. I fancy, indeed, that you are a man of very good breeding, or at least know how on occasion to behave like one." "'I am not particularly interested in anyone's opinion,' Svidrigailov answered dryly, and even with a shade of haughtiness. "'And therefore, why not be vulgar at times, when vulgarity is such a convenient cloak for our climate, and especially if one has a natural propensity that way?' he added, laughing again. But I've heard you have many friends here. You are, as they say, not without connections. What can you want with me, then, unless you have some special object?" "'That's true that I have friends here,' Svidrigailov admitted, not replying to the chief point. "'I've met some already. I've been lounging about for the last three days, and I've seen them, or they've seen me. That's a matter of course. I am well dressed and reckoned not a poor man. The emancipation of the serfs hasn't affected me. My property consists chiefly of forests and water meadows. The revenue has not fallen off. But I am not going to see them. I was sick of them long ago. I've been here three days and have called on no one. What a town it is! How has it come into existence among us, tell me that? A town of officials and students of all sorts. Yes, there's a great deal I didn't notice when I was here eight years ago, kicking up my heels. My only hope now is in anatomy, by Jove it is." Anatomy? But as for these clubs, Dussault's, parades, or progress indeed, maybe, well, all that can go on without me," he went on again without noticing the question. Besides, who wants to be a card-sharper? Why, have you been a card-sharper, then? How could I help being? There was a regular set of us, men of the best society, eight years ago. We had a fine time. And all men of breeding, you know, poets, men of property. And indeed, as a rule in our Russian society, the best manners are found among those who have been thrashed, have you noticed that? I've deteriorated in the country. But I did get into prison for debt, through a low Greek who came from Nezhen. Then Marfa Petrovna turned up. She bargained with him and bought me off for thirty thousand silver pieces. I owed seventy thousand. We were united in lawful wedlock, and she bore me off into the country like a treasure. You know she was five years older than I. She was very fond of me. For seven years I never left the country. And, take note, that all my life she held a document over me, the I.O.U. for thirty thousand roubles so if I were to elect to be restive about anything, I should be trapped at once. And she would have done it. Women find nothing incompatible in that. If it hadn't been for that, would you have given her the slip? I don't know what to say. It was scarcely the document restrained me. I didn't want to go anywhere else. Marfa Petrovna herself invited me to go abroad, seeing I was bored. 
but I'd been abroad before and always felt sick there. For no reason but the sunrise, the Bay of Naples, the sea, you look at them and it makes you sad. What's most revolting is that one is really sad. No, it's better at home. Here at least one blames others for everything and excuses oneself. I should have gone perhaps on an expedition to the North Pole, because j'ai le vent mauvais and hate drinking, and there's nothing left but wine. I have tried it. But, I say, I've been told old Berg is going up in a great balloon next Sunday from the Yusupov Garden and will take up passengers at a fee. Is it true? Why, would you go up? I? No, oh no muttered Svidrigailov, really seeming to be deep in thought. "'What does he mean? Is he in earnest?' Raskolnikov wondered. "'No, the document didn't restrain me,' Svidrigailov went on meditatively. "'It was my own doing, not leaving the country. And nearly a year ago Marfa Petrovna gave me back the document on my name-day, and made me a present of a considerable sum of money, too. She had a fortune, you know.' You see how I trust you, Arkady Ivanovitch. That was actually her expression. You don't believe she used it? But do you know I managed the estate quite decently? They know me in the neighborhood. I ordered books, too. Marfa Petrovna at first approved, but afterwards she was afraid of my overstudying. You seem to be missing Marfa Petrovna very much. Missing her? Perhaps. Really, perhaps I am. And, by the way, do you believe in ghosts?" "'What ghosts? Why, ordinary ghosts. Do you believe in them? Perhaps not, poor Vaupler, I wouldn't say so exactly. Do you see them, then?' Svidrigailov looked at him rather oddly. "'Marfa Petrovna is pleased to visit me,' he said, twisting his mouth into a strange smile. "'How do you mean she is pleased to visit you?' She has been three times. I saw her first on the very day of the funeral, an hour after she was buried. It was the day before I left to come here. The second time was the day before yesterday, at daybreak, on the journey at the station of Malaya Vishera. And the third time was two hours ago in the room where I am staying. I was alone. Were you awake? Quite awake. I was wide awake every time. She comes, speaks to me for a minute, and goes out at the door always at the door. I can almost hear her." "'What made me think that something of the sort must be happening to you?' Raskolnikov said suddenly. At the same moment he was surprised at having said it. He was much excited. "'What? Did you think so?' Svidrigailov asked in astonishment. "'Did you really? Didn't I say that there was something in common between us, eh?' "'You never said so,' Raskolnikov cried sharply and with heat didn't I? No. I thought I did. When I came in and saw you lying with your eyes shut, pretending, I said to myself at once, here's the man. What do you mean by the man? What are you talking about? cried Raskolnikov. What do I mean? I really don't know. Svidrigailov muttered ingenuously, as though he too were puzzled. For a minute they were silent. They stared in each other's faces. That's all nonsense!" Raskolnikov shouted with vexation. What does she say when she comes to you? She? Will you believe it, she talks of the silliest trifles and— Man is a strange creature. It makes me angry. The first time she came in, I was tired, you know, the funeral service, the funeral ceremony, the lunch afterwards. At last I was left alone in my study. I lighted a cigar and began to think. She came in at the door. You've been so busy today, Arkady Ivanovitch, you have forgotten to wind the dining-room clock," she said. All those seven years I've wound that clock every week, and if I forgot it she would always remind me. The next day I set off on my way here. I got out at the station at daybreak. I'd been asleep, tired out, with my eyes half open. I was drinking some coffee. I looked up and there was suddenly Marfa Petrovna sitting beside me with a pack of cards in her hands. Shall I tell you your fortune for the journey, Arkady Ivanovitch? She was a great hand at telling fortunes. I shall never forgive myself for not asking her to. 
I ran away in a fright, and besides, the bell rang. I was sitting today, feeling very heavy after a miserable dinner from a cookshop. I was sitting smoking, all of a sudden, Marfa Petrovna again. She came in very smart in a new green silk dress with a long train. Good day, Arkady Ivanovitch. How do you like my dress? Aniska can't make like this. Aniska was a dressmaker in the country, one of our former serf girls who had been trained in Moscow, a pretty wench. She stood turning round before me. I looked at the dress, and then I looked carefully, very carefully, at her face. I wonder you trouble to come to me about such trifles, Marfa Petrovna. Good gracious, you won't let one disturb you about anything. To tease her, I said, I want to get married, Marfa Petrovna. That's just like you, Arkady Ivanovitch. It does you very little credit to come looking for a bride when you've hardly buried your wife. And if you could make a good choice at least, but I know it won't be for your happiness or hers, you will only be a laughing-stock to all good people." Then she went out and her train seemed to rustle. Isn't it nonsense, eh? But perhaps you are telling lies," Raskolnikov put in. I rarely lie," answered Svidrigailov thoughtfully, apparently not noticing the rudeness of the question. And in the past, have you ever seen ghosts before? Yes, I have seen them, but only once in my life, six years ago. I had a serf, Filka. Just after his burial, I called out forgetting, Filka, my pipe! He came in and went to the cupboard where my pipes were. I sat still and thought, he is doing it out of revenge, because we had a violent quarrel just before his death. How dare you come in with a hole in your elbow, I said. Go away, you scamp! He turned and went out, and never came again. I didn't tell Marfa Petrovna at the time. I wanted to have a service sung for him, but I was ashamed. You should go to a doctor. I know I am not well, without your telling me, though I don't know what's wrong. I believe I am five times as strong as you are. I didn't ask you whether you believe that ghosts are seen, but whether you believe that they exist." No, I won't believe it! Raskolnikov cried with positive anger. What do people generally say? muttered Svidrigailov, as though speaking to himself, looking aside and bowing his head. They say, you are ill, so what appears to you is only unreal fantasy. But that's not strictly logical. I agree that ghosts only appear to the sick, but that only proves that they are unable to appear except to the sick, not that they don't exist. Nothing of the sort, Raskolnikov insisted irritably. No? You don't think so? Svidrigailov went on, looking at him deliberately. But what do you say to this argument? Help me with it. Ghosts are, as it were, shreds and fragments of other worlds, the beginning of them. A man in health has, of course, no reason to see them, because he is above all a man of this earth and is bound for the sake of completeness and order to live only in this life. But as soon as one is ill, as soon as the normal earthly order of the organism is broken, one begins to realize the possibility of another world, and the more seriously ill one is, the closer becomes one's contact with that other world, so that as soon as the man dies he steps straight into that world. I thought of that long ago. If you believe in a future life, you could believe in that, too." "'I don't believe in a future life,' said Raskolnikov. Svidrigailov sat lost in thought. "'And what if there are only spiders there, or something of that sort?' he said suddenly. "'He is a madman,' thought Raskolnikov. "'We always imagine eternity as something beyond our conception, something vast, vast. But why must it be vast? Instead of all that, what if it's one little room, like a bathhouse in the country, black and grimy and spiders in every corner, and that's all eternity is? I sometimes fancy it like that." "'Can it be you can imagine nothing juster and more comforting than that?' Raskolnikov cried with a feeling of anguish. "'Juster? And how can we tell, perhaps, that it is just? And do you know it's what I would certainly have made it?" answered Svidrigailov with a vague smile. This horrible answer sent a cold chill through Raskolnikov. Svidrigailov raised his head, looked at him, and suddenly began laughing. 
Only think," he cried, half an hour ago we had never seen each other, we regarded each other as enemies. There is a matter unsettled between us. We've thrown it aside, and away we've gone into the abstract. Wasn't I right in saying that we were birds of a feather?" "'Kindly allow me,' Raskolnikov went on irritably, "'to ask you to explain why you have honoured me with your visit. And—and I am in a hurry. I have no time to waste. I want to go out.' "'By all means, by all means. Your sister, Avdotya Romanovna, is going to be married to Mr. Luzhin, Pyotr Petrovitch?' Can you refrain from any question about my sister and from mentioning her name? I can't understand how you dare utter her name in my presence, if you really are Svidrigailov. Why, but I've come here to speak about her. How can I avoid mentioning her? Very good, speak, but make haste. I am sure that you must have formed your own opinion of this Mr. Luzhin, who is a connection of mine through my wife, if you have only seen him for half an hour or heard any facts about him. He is no match for Avdotya Romanovna. I believe Avdotya Romanovna is sacrificing herself generously and imprudently for the sake of... for the sake of her family. I fancy from all I had heard of you that you would be very glad if the match could be broken off without the sacrifice of worldly advantages. Now I know you personally, I am convinced of it. All this is very naive, excuse me, I should have said imprudent on your part said Raskolnikov. You mean to say that I am seeking my own ends? Don't be uneasy, Rodion Romanovitch. If I were working for my own advantage, I would not have spoken out so directly. I am not quite a fool. I will confess something psychologically curious about that. Just now, defending my love for Avdotya Romanovna, I said I was myself the victim. Well, let me tell you that I've no feeling of love now, not the slightest so that I wonder myself indeed, for I really did feel something." "'Through idleness and depravity,' Raskolnikov put in. "'I certainly am idle and depraved. But your sister has such qualities that even I could not help being impressed by them. But that's all nonsense, as I see myself now.' "'Have you seen that long?' I began to be aware of it before, but was only perfectly sure of it the day before yesterday almost at the moment I arrived in Petersburg. I still fancied in Moscow, though, that I was coming to try to get Avdotya Romanovna's hand and to cut out Mr. Luzhin. Excuse me for interrupting you, kindly be brief, and come to the object of your visit. I am in a hurry, I want to go out." With the greatest pleasure. On arriving here and determining on a certain journey, I should like to make some necessary preliminary arrangements. I left my children with an aunt they are well provided for, and they have no need of me personally. And a nice father I should make, too. I have taken nothing but what Marfa Petrovna gave me a year ago. That's enough for me. Excuse me, I am just coming to the point. Before the journey which may come off, I want to settle Mr. Luzhin, too. It's not that I detest him so much, but it was through him I quarrelled with Marfa Petrovna when I learned that she had dished up this marriage. I want now to see Avdotya Romanovna through your mediation, and if you like, in your presence, to explain to her that, in the first place, she will never gain anything but harm from Mr. Luzhin. Then, begging her pardon for all past unpleasantness, to make her a present of ten thousand roubles, and so assist the rupture with Mr. Luzhin, a rupture to which I believe she is herself not disinclined, if she could see the way to it. You are certainly mad! cried Raskolnikov, not so much angered as astonished. How dare you talk like that! I knew you would scream at me. But in the first place, though I am not rich, this ten thousand roubles is perfectly free. I have absolutely no need for it. If Avdotya Romanovna does not accept it, I shall waste it in some more foolish way. That's the first thing. Secondly, my conscience is perfectly easy. I make the offer with no ulterior motive. You may not believe it, but in the end Avdotya Romanovna and you will know. The point is that I did actually cause your sister, whom I greatly respect, some trouble and unpleasantness, and so, sincerely regretting it, I want, not to compensate, not to repay her for the unpleasantness, but simply to do something to her advantage, 
to show that I am not, after all, privileged to do nothing but harm. If there were a millionth fraction of self-interest in my offer, I should not have made it so openly, and I should not have offered her ten thousand only, when five weeks ago I offered her more. Besides, I may perhaps, very soon, marry a young lady, and that alone ought to prevent suspicion of any design on Avdotya Romanovna. In conclusion, let me say that in marrying Mr. Lusion she is taking money just the same, only from another man. Don't be angry, Rodion Romanovitch. Think it over coolly and quietly." Svidrigailov himself was exceedingly cool and quiet as he was saying this. "'I beg you to say no more,' said Raskolnikov. "'In any case, this is unpardonable impertinence.' "'Not in the least. Then a man may do nothing but harm to his neighbour in this world, and is prevented from doing the tiniest bit of good by trivial conventional formalities. That's absurd. If I died, for instance, and left that sum to your sister in my will, surely she wouldn't refuse it. Very likely she would. Oh, no, indeed. However, if you refuse it, so be it, though ten thousand roubles is a capital thing to have on occasion. In any case, I beg you to repeat what I have said to Avdotya Romanovna. No, I won't. In that case, Rodion Romanovitch, I shall be obliged to try and see her myself and worry her by doing so. And if I do tell her, will you not try to see her? I don't know really what to say. I should very much like to see her once more. Don't hope for it. I'm sorry, but you don't know me. Perhaps we may become better friends. You think we may become friends? And why not? Svidrigailov said, smiling. He stood up and took his hat. I didn't quite intend to disturb you, and I came here without reckoning on it though I was very much struck by your face this morning." "'Where did you see me this morning?' Raskolnikov asked uneasily. "'I saw you by chance. I kept fancying there was something about you like me. But don't be uneasy. I am not intrusive. I used to get on all right with card-sharpers, and I never bored Prince Sverbe, a great personage who is a distant relation of mine, and I could write about Raphael's Madonna in Madame Prilikov's album and I never left Marfa Petrovna's side for seven years, and I used to stay the night at Vyazemsky's house in the Haymarket in the old days, and I may go up in a balloon with Berg, perhaps." "'Oh, all right. Are you starting soon on your travels, may I ask?' "'What travels?' "'Why, on that journey you spoke of it yourself.' "'A journey? Oh, yes, I did speak of a journey. Well, that's a wide subject. If only you knew what you were asking he added and gave a sudden, loud, short laugh. Perhaps I'll get married instead of the journey. They're making a match for me. Here? Yes. How have you had time for that? But I am very anxious to see Avdotya Romanovna once. I earnestly beg it. Well, good-bye for the present. Oh, yes, I have forgotten something. Tell your sister, Rodion Romanovitch, that Marfa Petrovna remembered her in her will and left her three thousand roubles. That's absolutely certain. Marfa Petrovna arranged it a week before her death, and it was done in my presence. Avdotya Romanovna will be able to receive the money in two or three weeks. Are you telling the truth? Yes, tell her. Well, your servant. I'm staying very near you. As he went out, Svidrigailov ran up against Razumian in the doorway. End of Part 4 Chapter 1《Part Four, Chapter Two, of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Part Four, Chapter Two. It was nearly eight o'clock. The two young men hurried to Bakaliev's to arrive before Luzhin. Why, who was that? asked Razumian as soon as they were in the street. It was Svidrigailov, that landowner in whose house my sister was insulted when he was their governess. Through his persecuting her with his attentions, she was turned out by his wife, Marfa Petrovna. This Marfa Petrovna begged Donya's forgiveness afterwards, and she's just died suddenly. It was of her we were talking this morning. I don't know why I am afraid of that man. 
He came here at once after his wife's funeral. He is very strange, and is determined on doing something. We must guard Donia from him. That's what I wanted to tell you, do you hear? Guard her? What can he do to harm Avdotya Romanovna? Thank you, Rodya, for speaking to me like that. We will, we will guard her. Where does he live? I don't know. Why didn't you ask? What a pity! I'll find out, though." "'Did you see him?' asked Raskolnikov after a pause. "'Yes, I noticed him. I noticed him well.' "'You did really see him? You saw him clearly?' Raskolnikov insisted. "'Yes, I remember him perfectly. I should know him in a thousand. I have a good memory for faces.' They were silent again. "'Hm! That's all right.' muttered Raskolnikov. Do you know, I fancied? I keep thinking that it may have been an hallucination. What do you mean? I don't understand you. Well, you all say, Raskolnikov went on, twisting his mouth into a smile, that I am mad. I thought just now that perhaps I really am mad, and have only seen a phantom. What do you mean? Why, who can tell? Perhaps I am really mad, and perhaps everything that happened all these days may be only imagination. Ah, Rodya, you have been upset again. But what did he say? What did he come for? Raskolnikov did not answer. Razumihin thought a minute. Now let me tell you my story, he began. I came to you, you were asleep. Then we had dinner, and then I went to Porfiry's. Zamatov was still with him. I tried to begin, but it was no use. I couldn't speak in the right way. They don't seem to understand and can't understand, but are not a bit ashamed. I drew Porfiry to the window and began talking to him, but it was still no use. He looked away and I looked away. At last I shook my fist in his ugly face and told him as a cousin I'd brain him. He merely looked at me, I cursed and came away. That was all. It was very stupid. To Zamatov I didn't say a word. But, you see, I thought I'd make a mess of it, but as I went downstairs a brilliant idea struck me. Why should we trouble? Of course, if you were in any danger or anything, but why need you care? You needn't care a hang for them. We shall have a laugh at them afterwards, and if I were in your place I'd mystify them more than ever. How ashamed they'll be afterwards! Hang them! We can thrash them afterwards, but let's laugh at them now." "'To be sure,' answered Raskolnikov. "'But what will you say tomorrow?' he thought to himself. Strange to say, till that moment it had never occurred to him to wonder what Razumihin would think when he knew. As he thought it, Raskolnikov looked at him. Razumihin's account of his visit to Porfiry had very little interest for him, so much had come and gone since then. In the corridor they came upon Luzhin. He had arrived punctually at eight, and was looking for the number, so that all three went in together without greeting or looking at one another. The young men walked in first, while Pyotr Petrovitch, for good manners, lingered a little in the passage, taking off his coat. Polcheria Alexandrovna came forward at once to greet him in the doorway. Donia was welcoming her brother. Pyotr Petrovitch walked in, and quite amiably, though with redoubled dignity, bowed to the ladies. He looked, however, as though he were a little put out and could not yet recover himself. Pulcheria Alexandrovna, who seemed also a little embarrassed, hastened to make them all sit down at the round table where a samovar was boiling. Donia and Luzhin were facing one another on opposite sides of the table. Razumihin and Raskolnikov were facing Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Razumihin was next to Luzhin, and Raskolnikov was beside his sister. A moment's silence followed. Pyotr Petrovitch deliberately drew out a cambric handkerchief reeking of scent, and blew his nose with an air of a benevolent man who felt himself slighted, and was firmly resolved to insist on an explanation. In the passage the idea had occurred to him to keep on his overcoat and walk away and so give the two ladies a sharp and emphatic lesson and make them feel the gravity of the position. But he could not bring himself to do this. Besides, he could not endure uncertainty, and he wanted an explanation. If his request had been so openly disobeyed, 
there was something behind it, and in that case it was better to find it out beforehand. It rested with him to punish them, and there would always be time for that. "'I trust you had a favorable journey?' he inquired officially of Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'Oh, very, Pyotr Petrovitch. I am gratified to hear it. And Avdotya Romanovna is not over-fatigued either?' "'I am young and strong, I don't get tired, but it was a great strain for mother,' answered Donya. "'That's unavoidable. Our national railways are of terrible length. Mother Russia, as they say, is a vast country. In spite of all my desire to do so, I was unable to meet you yesterday. But I trust all passed off without inconvenience?" "'Oh, no, Pyotr Petrovitch, it was all terribly disheartening,' Pulcheria Alexandrova hastened to declare with peculiar intonation. And if Dmitri Prokovitch had not been sent us, I really believe by God himself, we should have been utterly lost. Here he is, Dmitri Prokovitch Razumian," she added, introducing him to Luzhin. "'I had the pleasure yesterday,' muttered Pyotr Petrovitch with a hostile glance sidelong at Razumian. Then he scowled and was silent. Pyotr Petrovitch belonged to that class of persons, on the surface very polite in society, who make a great point of punctiliousness, but who, directly they are crossed in anything, are completely disconcerted and become more like sacks of flour than elegant and lively men of society. Again all was silent. Raskolnikov was obstinately mute, Evdotya Romanovna was unwilling to open the conversation too soon. Razumian had nothing to say, so Pulcheria Alexandrovna was anxious again. "'Marfa Petrovna is dead, have you heard?' she began, having recourse to her leading item of conversation. To be sure, I heard so. I was immediately informed, and I have come to make you acquainted with the fact that Arkady Ivanovitch Svidrigailov set off in haste for Petersburg immediately after his wife's funeral. So at least I have excellent authority for believing." "'To Petersburg? Here?' Donya asked in alarm and looked at her mother. "'Yes, indeed, and doubtless not without some design, having in view the rapidity of his departure and all the circumstances preceding it. "'Good heavens! Won't he leave Donya in peace even here?' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'I imagine that neither you nor Avdotya Romanovna have any grounds for uneasiness, unless, of course, you are yourselves desirous of getting into communication with him. For my part I am on my guard, and am now discovering where he is lodging.' "'Oh, Pyotr Petrovitch! You would not believe what a fright you have given me," Pulcheria Alexandrovna went on. I've only seen him twice, but I thought him terrible, terrible. I am convinced that he was the cause of Marfa Petrovna's death. It's impossible to be certain about that. I have precise information. I do not dispute that he may have contributed to accelerate the course of events by the moral influence, so to say, of the affront but as to the general conduct and moral character of that personage, I am in agreement with you. I do not know whether he is well off now, and precisely what Marfa Petrovna left him. This will be known to me within a very short period. But no doubt, here in Petersburg, if he has any pecuniary resources, he will relapse at once into his old ways. He is the most depraved and abjectly vicious specimen of that class of men. I have considerable reason to believe that Marfa Petrovna, who was so unfortunate as to fall in love with him and to pay his debts eight years ago, was of service to him in another way, solely by her exertions and sacrifices, a criminal charge involving an element of fantastic and homicidal brutality for which he might well have been sentenced to Siberia, was hushed up. That's the sort of man he is, if you care to know." "'Good heavens!' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Raskolnikov listened attentively. "'Are you speaking the truth when you say that you have good evidence of this?' Donya asked sternly and emphatically. "'I only repeat what I was told in secret by Marfa Petrovna. I must observe that from the legal point of view the case was far from clear. There was, and I believe still is, living here a woman called Reslich, a foreigner, 
who lent small sums of money at interest and did other commissions, and with this woman Svidrigailov had for a long while close and mysterious relations. She had a relation, a niece, I believe, living with her, a deaf and dumb girl of fifteen, or perhaps not more than fourteen. Restlich hated this girl, and grudged her every crust. She used to beat her mercilessly. One day the girl was found hanging in the garret. At the inquest the verdict was suicide. After the usual proceedings the matter ended. But later on information was given that the child had been cruelly outraged by Svidrigailov. It is true this was not clearly established. The information was given by another German woman of loose character, whose word could not be trusted. No statement was actually made to the police, thanks to Marfa Petrovna's money and exertions. It did not get beyond gossip. And yet the story is a very significant one. You heard, no doubt, Avdotya Romanovna, when you were with them, the story of the servant Philip, who died of ill-treatment he received six years ago, before the abolition of serfdom. I heard, on the contrary, that this Philip hanged himself. Quite so. But what drove him, or rather perhaps disposed him, to suicide was the systematic persecution and severity of Mr. Svidrigailov. I don't know that," answered Donia dryly. I only heard a queer story that Philip was a sort of hypochondriac, a sort of domestic philosopher, the servants used to say, he read himself silly, and that he hanged himself partly on account of Mr. Svidrigailov's mockery of him and not his blows. When I was there he behaved well to the servants, and they were actually fond of him, though they certainly did blame him for Philip's death. I perceive, Avdotya Romanovna, that you seem disposed to undertake his defence all of a sudden," Luzhin observed, twisting his lips into an ambiguous smile. There is no doubt that he is an astute man, and insinuating where ladies are concerned, of which Marfa Petrovna, who has died so strangely, is a terrible instance. My only desire has been to be of service to you and your mother with my advice, in view of the renewed efforts which may certainly be anticipated from him. For my part, it's my firm conviction that he will end in a debtor's prison again. Marfa Petrovna had not the slightest intention of settling anything substantial on him, having regard for his children's interests, and if she left him anything it would only be the merest sufficiency, something insignificant and ephemeral, which would not last a year for a man of his habits. "'Pyotr Petrovitch, I beg you,' said Donya, "'say no more of Mr. Svidrigailov. It makes me miserable." "'He has just been to see me,' said Raskolnikov, breaking his silence for the first time. There were exclamations from all, and they all turned to him. Even Pyotr Petrovitch was roused. "'An hour and a half ago he came in when I was asleep, waked me, and introduced himself,' Raskolnikov continued. "'He was fairly cheerful and at ease, and quite hopes that we shall become friends. He is particularly anxious, by the way, Donya, for an interview with you, at which he asked me to assist. He has a proposition to make to you, and he told me about it. He told me, too, that a week before her death Marfa Petrovna left you three thousand roubles in her will, Donya, and that you can receive the money very shortly." "'Thank God!' cried Polcheria Alexandrovna, crossing herself. "'Pray for her soul, Donya. "'It's a fact,' broke from Luzhin. Tell us, what more?" Donya urged Raskolnikov. Then he said that he wasn't rich and all the estate was left to his children, who are now with an aunt, then that he was staying somewhere not far from me, but where, I don't know, I didn't ask. "'But what, what does he want to propose to Donya?' cried Polcheria Alexandrovna in a fright. "'Did he tell you?' "'Yes.' "'What was it?' "'I'll tell you afterwards.' Raskolnikov ceased speaking and turned his attention to his tea. Pyotr Petrovitch looked at his watch. "'I am compelled to keep a business engagement, and so I shall not be in your way,' he added with an air of some pique, and he began getting up. "'Don't go, Pyotr Petrovitch,' said Donya. "'You intended to spend the evening. Besides, you wrote yourself that you wanted to have an explanation with mother.' "'Precisely so, Evdotya Romanovna. Pyotr Petrovitch answered impressively, sitting down again but still holding his hat. 
I certainly desired an explanation with you and your honoured mother upon a very important point indeed. But as your brother cannot speak openly in my presence of some proposals of Mr. Svidrigailov, I too do not desire and am not able to speak openly, in the presence of others, of certain matters of the greatest gravity. Moreover, my most weighty and urgent request has been disregarded." Assuming an aggrieved air, Lusion relapsed into dignified silence. "'Your request that my brother should not be present at our meeting was disregarded solely at my insistence,' said Donia. "'You wrote that you had been insulted by my brother. I think that this must be explained at once, and you must be reconciled. And if Rodya really has insulted you, then he should and will apologize." Pyotr Petrovitch took a stronger line. "'There are insults, Avdotya Romanovna, which no good will can make us forget. There is a line in everything which it is dangerous to overstep, and when it has been overstepped there is no return.' "'That wasn't what I was speaking of exactly, Pyotr Petrovitch. Donya interrupted with some impatience. Please understand that our whole future depends now on whether all this is explained and set right as soon as possible. I tell you frankly at the start that I cannot look at it in any other light, and if you have the least regard for me, all this business must be ended today, however hard that may be. I repeat that if my brother is to blame, he will ask your forgiveness. I am surprised at your putting the question like that," said Lusian, getting more and more irritated. Esteeming, and so to say, adoring you, I may at the same time, very well indeed, be able to dislike some member of your family. Though I lay claim to the happiness of your hand, I cannot accept duties incompatible with— Oh, don't be so ready to take offence, Pyotr Petrovitch," Donya interrupted with feeling and be the sensible and generous man I have always considered, and wish to consider you to be. I have given you a great promise. I am your betrothed. Trust me in this matter, and, believe me, I shall be capable of judging impartially. My assuming the part of judge is as much a surprise for my brother as for you. When I insisted on his coming to our interview today after your letter, I told him nothing of what I meant to do. Understand that, if you are not reconciled, I must choose between you, it must be either you or he. That is how the question rests on your side and on his. I don't want to be mistaken in my choice, and I must not be. For your sake I must break off with my brother, for my brother's sake I must break off with you. I can find out for certain now whether he is a brother to me, and I want to know it, and of you, whether I am dear to you, whether you esteem me, whether you are the husband for me." Avdotya Romanovna, Lusian declared huffily, your words are of too much consequence to me. I will say more. They are offensive in view of the position I have the honour to occupy in relation to you. To say nothing of your strange and offensive setting me on a level with an impertinent boy, you admit the possibility of breaking your promise to me. You say you or he showing thereby of how little consequence I am in your eyes. I cannot let this pass considering the relationship and the obligations existing between us." "'What?' cried Donia, flushing. "'I set your interest beside all that has hitherto been most precious in my life, what has made up the whole of my life, and here you are offended at my making too little account of you.' Raskolnikov smiled sarcastically. Razumian fidgeted, but Pyotr Petrovitch did not accept the reproof. On the contrary, at every word he became more persistent and irritable, as though he relished it. "'Love for the future partner of your life, for your husband, ought to outweigh your love for your brother,' he pronounced sententiously. "'And, in any case, I cannot be put on the same level.' Although I said so emphatically that I would not speak openly in your brother's presence, nevertheless I intend now to ask your honoured mother for a necessary explanation on a point of great importance closely affecting my dignity. Your son, he turned to Polcheria Alexandrovna, yesterday in the presence of Mr. Razutkin, or I think that's it, excuse me, I have forgotten your surname, he bowed politely to Razumian. 
insulted me by misrepresenting the idea I expressed to you in a private conversation drinking coffee, that is, that marriage with a poor girl who has had experience of trouble is more advantageous from the conjugal point of view than with one who has lived in luxury, since it is more profitable for the moral character. Your son intentionally exaggerated the significance of my words and made them ridiculous, accusing me of malicious intentions and, as far as I could see, relied upon your correspondence with him. I shall consider myself happy, Pulcheria Alexandrovna, if it is possible for you to convince me of an opposite conclusion, and thereby considerately reassure me. Kindly let me know in what terms precisely you repeated my words in your letter to Rodion Romanovitch." "'I don't remember,' faltered Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'I repeated them as I understood them. I don't know how Rodya repeated them to you, perhaps he exaggerated." He could not have exaggerated them except at your instigation. Pyotr Petrovitch, Polcheria Alexandrovna declared with dignity, the proof that Donya and I did not take your words in a very bad sense is the fact that we are here. Good, mother, said Donya approvingly. Then this is my fault again, said Luzhin aggrieved. Well, Pyotr Petrovitch, you keep blaming Rodion, but you yourself have just written what was false about him," Polcheria Alexandrovna added, gaining courage. I don't remember writing anything false. You wrote, Raskolnikov said sharply, not turning to Luzhin, that I gave money yesterday, not to the widow of the man who was killed, as was the fact, but to his daughter, whom I had never seen till yesterday. You wrote this to make dissension between me and my family, and for that object added coarse expressions about the conduct of a girl whom you don't know. All that is mean slander." "'Excuse me, sir,' said Luzhin, quivering with fury. I enlarged upon your qualities and conduct in my letter solely in response to your sister's and mother's inquiries, how I found you and what impression you made on me. As for what you've alluded to in my letter, be so good as to point out one word of falsehood. Show, that is, that you didn't throw away your money, and that there are not worthless persons in that family, however unfortunate. To my thinking, you, with all your virtues, are not worth the little finger of that unfortunate girl at whom you throw stones. Would you go so far, then, as to let her associate with your mother and sister? I have done so already, if you care to know. I made her sit down today with mother and Donya. Rodya! cried Polcheria Alexandrovna. Donya crimsoned. Azumian knitted his brows. Luzhin smiled with lofty sarcasm. You may see for yourself, Avdotya Romanovna, he said, whether it is possible for us to agree. I hope now that this question is at an end, once and for all. I will withdraw, that I may not hinder the pleasures of family intimacy and the discussion of secrets." He got up from his chair and took his hat. But in withdrawing, I venture to request that for the future I may be spared similar meetings, and, so to say, compromises. I appeal particularly to you, honored Polcheria Alexandrovna, on this subject, the more as my letter was addressed to you and to no one else." Polcheria Alexandrovna was a little offended. You seem to think we are completely under your authority, Pyotr Petrovitch. Donya has told you the reason your desire was disregarded, she had the best intentions. And indeed, you write as though you were laying commands upon me. Are we to consider every desire of yours as a command? Let me tell you on the contrary that you ought to show particular delicacy and consideration for us now, because we have thrown up everything and have come here relying on you and so we are in any case, in a sense, in your hands." "'That is not quite true, Polcheria Alexandrovna, especially at the present moment, when the news has come of Marfa Petrovna's legacy, which seems indeed very apropos, judging from the new tone you take to me,' he added sarcastically. "'Judging from that remark, we may certainly presume that you are reckoning on our helplessness,' Donya observed irritably but now, in any case, I cannot reckon on it, and I particularly desire not to hinder your discussion of the secret proposals of Arkady Ivanovitch Svedrigailov, which he has entrusted to your brother, 
and which have, I perceive, a great and possibly a very agreeable interest for you." "'Good heavens!' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Razumian could not sit still on his chair. "'Aren't you ashamed now, sister?' asked Raskolnikov. "'I am ashamed, Rodya,' said Donya. "'Pyotr Petrovitch, go away!' She turned to him, white with anger. Pyotr Petrovitch had apparently not at all expected such a conclusion. He had too much confidence in himself, in his power and in the helplessness of his victims. He could not believe it even now. He turned pale and his lips quivered. Avdotya Romanovna, if I go out of this door now, after such a dismissal, then, you may reckon on it, I will never come back. Consider what you are doing. My word is not to be shaken." "'What insolence!' cried Donya, springing up from her seat. "'I don't want you to come back again!' "'What? So, that's how it stands!' cried Lucian, utterly unable to the last moment to believe in the rupture, and so completely thrown out of his reckoning now. "'So that's how it stands! But do you know, Avdotya Romanovna, that I might protest?' What right have you to speak to her like that?" Pulcheria Alexandrovna intervened hotly. And what can you protest about? What rights have you? Am I to give my Donia to a man like you? Go away, leave us all together. We are to blame for having agreed to a wrong action, and I above all." "'But you have bound me, Pulcheria Alexandrovna!' Lucian stormed in a frenzy. "'By your promise! And now you deny it! And, besides, I have been led on on account of that into expenses." This last complaint was so characteristic of Pyotr Petrovitch that Raskolnikov, pale with anger and with the effort of restraining it, could not help breaking into laughter. But Polcheria Alexandrovna was furious. "'Expenses? What expenses? Are you speaking of our trunk? But the conductor brought it for nothing for you. Mercy on us! We have bound you! What are you thinking about, Pyotr Petrovitch? It was you bound us, hand and foot, not we!" "'Enough, mother, no more, please,' Avdotya Romanovna implored. "'Pyotr Petrovitch, do be kind and go!' "'I am going, but one last word,' he said, quite unable to control himself. "'Your mamma seems to have entirely forgotten that I made up my mind to take you, so to speak, after the gossip of the town had spread all over the district in regard to your reputation. Disregarding public opinion for your sake and reinstating your reputation, I certainly might very well reckon on a fitting return, and might indeed look for gratitude on your part. And my eyes have only now been opened. I see myself that I may have acted very, very recklessly in disregarding the universal verdict." Does the fellow want his head smashed?" cried Razumian, jumping up. "'You are a mean and spiteful man!' cried Donya. "'Not a word! Not a movement!' cried Raskolnikov, holding Razumian back. Then, going close up to Luzhin, "'Kindly leave the room,' he said quietly and distinctly. "'And not a word more, or—' Pyotr Petrovitch gazed at him for some seconds with a pale face that worked with anger, then he turned, went out, and rarely has any man carried away in his heart such vindictive hatred as he felt against Raskolnikov. Him and him alone he blamed for everything. It is noteworthy that, as he went downstairs, he still imagined that his case was perhaps not utterly lost, and that, so far as the ladies were concerned, all might very well indeed be set right again. End of Part 4 Chapter 2Part 4, Chapter 3 of Crime and Punishment by Fyodor Dostoevsky, translated by Constance Garnett, 1861 to 1946. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4, Chapter 3. The fact was that, up to the last moment, he had never expected such an ending. He had been overbearing to the last degree, 
never dreaming that two destitute and defenceless women could escape from his control. This conviction was strengthened by his vanity and conceit, a conceit to the point of fatuity. Pyotr Petrovitch, who had made his way up from insignificance, was morbidly given to self-admiration, had the highest opinion of his intelligence and capacities, and sometimes even gloated in solitude over his image in the glass. But what he loved and valued above all was the money he had amassed by his labor, and by all sorts of devices. That money made him the equal of all who had been his superiors. When he had bitterly reminded Donia that he had decided to take her in spite of evil report, Pyotr Petrovitch had spoken with perfect sincerity, and had, indeed, felt genuinely indignant at such black ingratitude. And yet, when he made Donia his offer, he was fully aware of the groundlessness of all the gossip. The story had been everywhere contradicted by Marfa Petrovna, and was by then disbelieved by all the townspeople, who were warm in Donia's defence. And he would not have denied that he knew all that at the time. Yet he still thought highly of his own resolution in lifting Donia to his level, and regarded it as something heroic. In speaking of it to Donia, he had let out the secret feeling he cherished and admired, and he could not understand that others should fail to admire it too. He had called on Raskolnikov with the feelings of a benefactor, who is about to reap the fruits of his good deeds and to hear agreeable flattery. And as he went downstairs now, he considered himself most undeservedly injured and unrecognized. Donia was simply essential to him. To do without her was unthinkable. For many years he had had voluptuous dreams of marriage, but he had gone on waiting and amassing money. He brooded with relish, in profound secret, over the image of a girl, virtuous, poor, she must be poor, very young, very pretty, of good birth and education, very timid, one who had suffered much, and was completely humbled before him, one who would all her life look on him as her saviour, worship him, admire him, and only him. How many scenes, how many amorous episodes he had imagined on this seductive and playful theme, when his work was over! And behold, the dream of so many years was all but realized. The beauty and education of Avdotya Romanovna had impressed him. Her helpless position had been a great allurement. In her he had found even more than he dreamed of. Here was a girl of pride, character, virtue, of education and breeding superior to his own, he felt that, and this creature would be slavishly grateful all her life for his heroic condescension, and would humble herself in the dust before him and he would have absolute, unbounded power over her. Not long before, he had, too, after long reflection and hesitation, made an important change in his career, and was now entering on a wider circle of business. With this change his cherished dreams of rising into a higher class of society seemed likely to be realized. He was, in fact, determined to try his fortune in Petersburg. He knew that women could do a very great deal. The fascination of a charming, virtuous, highly educated woman might make his way easier, might do wonders in attracting people to him, throwing an aureole round him, and now everything was in ruins. This sudden, horrible rupture affected him like a clap of thunder. It was like a hideous joke, an absurdity. He had only been a tiny bit masterful, had not even time to speak out, had simply made a joke been carried away, and it had ended so seriously. And of course, too, he did love Donia in his own way. He already possessed her in his dreams, and all at once. No, the next day, the very next day, it must all be set right, smoothed over, settled. Above all, he must crush that conceited milksop who was the cause of it all. With a sick feeling he could not help recalling Razumian too, but he soon reassured himself on that score. As though a fellow like that could be put on a level with him! The man he really dreaded in earnest was Svidrigailov. He had, in short, a great deal to attend to. No, I, 
I am more to blame than anyone," said Dona, kissing and embracing her mother. I was tempted by his money, but on my honor, brother, I had no idea he was such a base man. If I had seen through him before, nothing would have tempted me. Don't blame me, brother. God has delivered us, God has delivered us, Pulcheria Alexandrovna muttered, but half consciously, as though scarcely able to realize what had happened. They were all relieved, and in five minutes they were laughing. Only now and then Donia turned white and frowned, remembering what had passed. Pulcheria Alexandrovna was surprised to find that she too was glad. She had only that morning thought rupture with Lucian a terrible misfortune. Razumian was delighted. He did not yet dare express his joy fully, but he was in a fever of excitement as though a ton weight had fallen off his heart. Now he had the right to devote his life to them, to serve them. Anything might happen now. But he felt afraid to think of further possibilities, and dared not let his imagination range. But Raskolnikov sat still in the same place, almost sullen and indifferent. Though he had been the most insistent on getting rid of Lucian, he seemed now the least concerned at what had happened. Donia could not help thinking that he was still angry with her, and Pulcheria Alexandrovna watched him timidly. "'What did Svidrigailov say to you?' said Donia, approaching him. "'Yes, yes,' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Raskolnikov raised his head. "'He wants to make you a present of ten thousand roubles, and he desires to see you once in my presence.' "'See her? On no account!' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'And how dare he offer her money!' Then Raskolnikov repeated, rather dryly, his conversation with Svidrigailov, omitting his account of the ghostly visitations of Marfa Petrovna, wishing to avoid all unnecessary talk. "'What answer did you give him?' asked Donia. "'At first I said I would not take any message to you. Then he said that he would do his utmost to obtain an interview with you without my help. He assured me that his passion for you was a passing infatuation. Now he has no feeling for you. He doesn't want you to marry Lucian. His talk was altogether rather muddled." "'How do you explain him to yourself, Rodya? How did he strike you?' "'I must confess I don't quite understand him. He offers you ten thousand, and yet says he is not well off. He says he is going away, and in ten minutes he forgets he has said it. Then he says he is going to be married and has already fixed on the girl. No doubt he has a motive, and probably a bad one. But it's odd that he should be so clumsy about it if he had any designs against you. Of course I refused his money on your account once for all. Altogether I thought him very strange. One might almost think he was mad. But I may be mistaken. That may only be the part he assumes. The death of Marfa Petrovna seems to have made a great impression on him." "'God rest her soul!' exclaimed Pulcheria Alexandrovna. "'I shall always, always pray for her. Where should we be now, Donia, without this three thousand? It's as though it had fallen from heaven. Why, Rodya, this morning we had only three roubles in our pocket, and Donia and I were just planning to pawn her watch so as to avoid borrowing from that man until he offered help." Donia seemed strangely impressed by Svidrigailov's offer. She still stood meditating. "'He has got some terrible plan,' she said in a half-whisper to herself, almost shuddering. Raskolnikov noticed this disproportionate terror. "'I fancy I shall have to see him more than once again,' he said to Donia. "'We will watch him. I will track him out," cried Razumian vigorously. I won't lose sight of him. Rodya has given me leave. He said to me himself just now, Take care of my sister. Will you give me leave too, Avdotya Romanovna? Donya smiled and held out her hand, but the look of anxiety did not leave her face. Pulcheria Alexandrovna gazed at her timidly, but the three thousand roubles had obviously a soothing effect on her. A quarter of an hour later they were all engaged in a lively conversation. 
Even Raskolnikov listened attentively for some time, though he did not talk. Razumian was the speaker. "'And why, why should you go away?' he flowed on ecstatically. "'And what are you to do in a little town? The great thing is, you are all here together, and you need one another, you do need one another, believe me. For a time, anyway, take me into partnership, and I'll assure you we'll plan a capital enterprise. Listen, I'll explain it all in detail to you, the whole project. It all flashed into my head this morning, before anything had happened. I tell you what, I have an uncle, I must introduce him to you, a most accommodating and respectable old man. This uncle has got a capital of a thousand roubles, and he lives on his pension and has no need of that money. For the last two years he has been bothering me to borrow it from him and pay him six per cent, interest. I know what that means. He simply wants to help me. Last year I had no need of it, but this year I resolved to borrow it as soon as he arrived. Then you lend me another thousand of your three, and we have enough for a start, so we'll go into partnership. And what are we going to do?" Then Razumian began to unfold his project, and he explained at length that almost all our publishers and booksellers know nothing at all of what they are selling. And for that reason they are usually bad publishers, and that any decent publications pay as a rule and give a profit, sometimes a considerable one. Razumian had, indeed, been dreaming of setting up as a publisher. For the last two years he had been working in publishers' offices, and knew three European languages well, though he had told Raskolnikov six days before that he was a swatch in German with an object of persuading him to take half his translation and half the payment for it. He had told a lie then, and Raskolnikov knew he was lying. Why, why should we let our chance slip when we have one of the chief means of success, money of our own? cried Razumian warmly. Of course there will be a lot of work. But we will work, you, Avdotya Romanovna, I, Rodion. You get a splendid profit on some books nowadays. And the great point of the business is that we shall know just what wants translating, and we shall be translating, publishing, learning all at once. I can be of use because I have experience. For nearly two years I've been sculling about among the publishers, and now I know every detail of their business. You need not be a saint to make pots, believe me. And why, why should we let our chance slip? Why, I know, and I kept the secret, two or three books which one might get a hundred roubles simply for thinking of translating and publishing. Indeed, and I would not take five hundred for the very idea of one of them. And what do you think? If I were to tell a publisher, I dare say he'd hesitate. They are such blockheads. And as for the business side, printing, paper, selling, you trust to me, I know my way about. We'll begin in a small way and go on to a large. In any case, it will get us our living and we shall get back our capital." Donya's eyes shone. "'I like what you are saying, Dmitri Prokovitch,' she said. "'I know nothing about it, of course,' put in Polcheria Alexandrovna. It may be a good idea, but again, God knows. It's new and untried. Of course, we must remain here at least for a time." She looked at Rodya. "'What do you think, brother?' said Donya. "'I think he's got a very good idea,' he answered. "'Of course, it's too soon to dream of a publishing firm, but we certainly might bring out five or six books and be sure of success. I know of one book, myself, which would be sure to go well. And as for his being able to manage it, there's no doubt about that either. He knows the business. But we can talk it over later." "'Hurrah!' cried Razumian. "'Now stay. There's a flat here in this house, belonging to the same owner. It's a special flat apart, not communicating with these lodgings. It's furnished, rent moderate, three rooms. Suppose you take them to begin with. I'll pawn your watch tomorrow and bring you the money, and everything can be arranged then. You can all three live together, and Rodya will be with you. But where are you off to, Rodya? What, Rodya, you are going already? Polcheria Alexandrovna asked in dismay. At such a minute? cried Razumian. Donya looked at her brother with incredulous wonder. 
He held his cap in his hand. He was preparing to leave them. "'One would think you were burying me or saying good-bye forever,' he said somewhat oddly. He attempted to smile, but it did not turn out a smile. "'But who knows? Perhaps it is the last time we shall see each other.' He let slip accidentally. It was what he was thinking, and it somehow was uttered aloud. "'What is the matter with you?' cried his mother. "'Where are you going, Rodya? asked Donya, rather strangely. "'Oh, I'm quite obliged to,' he answered vaguely, as though hesitating what he would say. But there was a look of sharp determination in his white face. "'I meant to say, as I was coming here, I meant to tell you, mother, and you, Donya, that it would be better for us to part for a time. I feel ill, I am not at peace. I will come afterwards, I will come of myself, when it's possible. I remember you and love you. Leave me, leave me alone. I decided this even before. I'm absolutely resolved on it. Whatever may come to me, whether I come to ruin or not, I want to be alone. Forget me altogether, it's better. Don't inquire about me. When I can, I'll come of myself, or I'll send for you. Perhaps it will all come back, but now, if you love me, give me up, else I shall begin to hate you. I feel it. Good-bye." "'Good God!' cried Pulcheria Alexandrovna. Both his mother and his sister were terribly alarmed. Razumian was also. "'Rodia, Rodia, be reconciled with us. Let us be as before,' cried his poor mother. He turned slowly to the door and slowly went out of the room. Donya overtook him. "'Brother, what are you doing to mother?' she whispered, her eyes flashing with indignation. He looked dully at her. "'No matter. I shall come. I'm coming,' he muttered in an undertone, as though not fully conscious of what he was saying, and he went out of the room. "'Wicked, heartless egoist!' cried Donya. He is insane, but not heartless. He is mad. Don't you see it? You're heartless after that," Razumian whispered in her ear, squeezing her hand tightly. "'I shall be back directly,' he shouted to the horror-stricken mother, and he ran out of the room. Raskolnikov was waiting for him at the end of the passage. "'I knew you would run after me,' he said. "'Go back to them. Be with them. Be with them tomorrow and always. I... Perhaps I shall come, if I can. Good-bye." And without holding out his hand he walked away. "'But where are you going? What are you doing? What's the matter with you? How can you go on like this?' Razumian muttered, at his wit's end. Raskolnikov stopped once more. "'Once for all, never ask me about anything. I have nothing to tell you. Don't come to see me. Maybe I'll come here. Leave me, but don't leave them. Do you understand me?" It was dark in the corridor, they were standing near the lamp. For a minute they were looking at one another in silence. Razumin remembered that minute all his life. Raskolnikov's burning and intent eyes grew more penetrating every moment, piercing into his soul, into his consciousness. Suddenly Razumin started. Something strange, as it were, passed between them. Some idea, some hint, as it were, slipped, something awful, hideous, and suddenly understood on both sides. Razumian turned pale. "'Do you understand now?' said Raskolnikov, his face twitching nervously. "'Go back, go to them,' he said suddenly, and turning quickly, he went out of the house. I will not attempt to describe how Razumian went back to the ladies, how he soothed them, how he protested that Rodya needed rest in his illness, protested that Rodya was sure to come, that he would come every day, that he was very, very much upset, that he must not be irritated, that he, Razumian, would watch over him, would get him a doctor, the best doctor, a consultation. In fact, from that evening Razumian took his place with them as a son and a brother. End of Part 4 Chapter 3